Good morning on this 10th day of Christmas. Our January birthdays are Janet Strauss, David Klein, Julia Person, Howard and Quincy Williams, and Bill and Betty Hare on the 21st of January will have their 59th wedding anniversary. Next Sunday, please prepare yourselves with a piece of bread and some juice, any kind of juice. It doesn't have to be grape juice. But we will be having communion, virtual communion. So prepare for that part of our worship service for next week. Let us quiet our hearts and our minds and listen to our prelude in preparation for worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For our call to worship, come let us worship, for we are the people of God's pasture. Come let us worship and bow down, for we are the sheep of God's hand. Come let us worship and bow down before the Lord our Maker, for the Lord is our God, and God desires our worship. Let us pray. O God, who created all things and called them good, grant us the grace to understand that you are a God of love and of joy. Help us to serve you with joyous hearts, filled with your love, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please join in the singing of Come, Let Us All Unite and Sing.
I have not had an update this week uh, on Marilyn or Scott. I have been in contact with Bev Binkley and she appreciates our continuing prayers and caring for her in her time of mourning and loss. Let us prepare our hearts for a morning prayer. Gentle shepherd, come and lead us. Before we pray, I would like to give my thanks to this faith family for their generosity to me. I've only been here the past six months, maybe not that long, but you have blessed me more than I deserve with your Christmas gift. Thank you. Dear God, there are so many ways that we feel apart this morning, whether physically, mentally, emotionally, certainly socially, we miss one another. God, we know that there is hope with the new vaccines. And yet there are so many people who are resisting taking those vaccines and even one person who has deliberately destroyed a quantity of vaccine so that it can't be given to deserving people. God, we can't possibly understand the minds of people who seem bent on destroying hope for others. We feel sadness this morning for this relatively young man who's shot and killed three people in Rockford on Christmas. We don't know his frame of mind, 
only that he had an outstanding military record with four deploys to Afghanistan. Too often we are condemning when we should be in sympathy for whatever drove his mental attitude to do that kind of destruction to innocent people. And then again, Saturday morning the news was another shooting in Rockford, the first homicides of the year. God, when is our violence going to end? When will we finally learn how to detect when people are so out of it that they lose their sense of reason and decency? God, this morning we pray for Richard and Marilyn. For Marilyn in her struggle with many physical problems. Give her the peace that passes all other understanding. For she has chosen this way and she loves and believes in you to do your will we pray for Scott and what is ahead for him God there are so many people that are out there that are begging for help whether it's food shelter rent to pay their money to pay their rent jobs people willing to work but no jobs we live in a community where we are fortunate to somehow not have the violence we know that there are calls to the police department for domestic issues. But hopefully, our little community of Polo will continue to reach out to others when we sense the need. And also in your wisdom and believing in you, we may have new ideas on how we can be helping people. God, we know that there are many needs that people are too proud to share. We pray for those unspoken needs. We pray for people who do not understand your love and your care for all people. Give us the sensitivity to reach out. The wisdom to know how as Jesus has taught us in caring for people caring for our community, living together, united. We pray these things this morning and not forgiving and forgetting, but offering our praise and thanksgiving to you, our Heavenly Father for all the blessings that we receive 
and we don't count how many things because your goodness and your giving is without end. For this we pray. Amen. Worshiping with our gifts, let us again pray. Gracious God, we thank you for gifts that belong not to us alone, but to all our sisters and brothers, since they too are created in your image. Let their need become our need. Let their hunger become our hunger. And grant to us also a portion of their pain, so that in sharing ourselves, we discover the Christ who walks with our brothers and sisters. Amen. Our scripture today is from Luke 2, verses 41 through 52. This is the boy Jesus at the temple. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. We have been celebrating Christmas. My message today is growing in wisdom. Have you considered that... Christmas is the celebration of God becoming a man. We think of Christmas time as being celebrating the infant Jesus. The incarnation. But how should the incarnation, how should Jesus' humanity change and affect our everyday lives? Today, January 3rd, is the 10th day of Christmas. The Gospel of Luke presents Jesus as the Son of Man and emphasizes his humanity, while the Gospel of John emphasizes Jesus' divinity as the Son of God. It is important that we keep the two natures of Christ together. He was more than that. Jesus grew in wisdom, human, but not totally human, He was almost human, but not quite human, and that is sort of how we view Jesus. But Jesus was totally human. He was and is both fully God and fully man, and as man, he showed us what it means to be truly human in this world. As a human, Jesus teaches us how to grow in wisdom. How did he grow in wisdom? He grew in wisdom the same way we are to grow in wisdom. He learned and applied God's truth to real life. This is wisdom. The skill of applying God's truth to real life 
Luke tells us two times that Jesus grew in wisdom. Once at the end of the verse 52 that I just read, and another time at the beginning of the story in verse 40. Luke wants us to see in this story how Jesus grew in wisdom and how he should grow in wisdom as well. In our Western individualistic culture, we are tempted to believe that we gain wisdom in isolation. If you read a lot or believe you will grow in wisdom by living life your own way, or if you can only avoid pain and suffering, you will be able to grow in wisdom. Jesus teaches us the truth is actually the very opposite. Jesus teaches us that true wisdom grows in community, obedience, and trials, or tests. I've been teaching a class for older adults for 13 years at the Dixon Church, and we have had wonderful discussions on Sunday morning and Sunday school. When we think we have had too much in our lives and it becomes uh, a struggle, we have to remind ourselves that we learn wisdom by the experiences that we go through in our daily lives. Jesus teaches us that true wisdom means being involved with other people. He didn't take isolation means, but he did do a lot of study time alone. Remember how he would go off in the desert to pray? We might think those were isolation times, but it was a time of prayer and study. What Luke emphasizes is that Jesus grew in wisdom because of the theological communities that he was a part of. His family community and his faith community were both challenging communities. Challenging communities. Asking questions. Listening to the answers. If we are to grow in wisdom, we need to be part of the communities that challenge us. Remember every year Jesus parents traveled with him to the feast of the Passover in Jerusalem. That was more than 80 miles on foot. We know that Jesus' parents were very poor, but it didn't matter. Every year they made that challenging trip. Why? Why do we do things that are difficult? Because the devotion to God and being with his people were worth the challenge. I am asked every year that I go to an annual conference, you're here again. Yes, I've been serving as head teller for annual conference for I think it's 30, 32 years now. Why? I am challenged. I am challenged to learn, not from sitting in a hotel room, but from participating with listening to the discussions of standing committee, from listening to the discussions of the business on the floor of annual conference. It is a challenge, and it challenges me and my group of tellers to do a complete and accurate job of tallying the counts out there on the floor when they are called for. It's a challenge. And I try on challenge. Jesus grew in wisdom because he grew up in a family that was faithful to God no matter what the challenge. We learn that he stays back at 12 years old. Where was he? 
He wasn't sitting by himself under a tree reading the Bible. He wasn't out playing with the boys. He was in the most challenging theological community discussing the Bible at 12 years old. Jesus grew in wisdom because he grew up in a family that was faithful to God, no matter what the challenge. There is nothing wrong with personal study or playing games, but we do not do our young people any service by underestimating their ability to be wise at a young age and removing them from the communities that challenge them. That is one of the main ways we grow. We tend to think that we can grow wise on our own and that what we need is for people who challenge us to leave us alone. But we need other people. We need to be in communities that challenge us. But we don't just need to be a part of a challenging community. We need to be a part of a humble community. Jesus stayed behind to be a part of a community group, but that isn't enough. The attitude you bring to that community group matters. How did Jesus approach the group? All those scribes, priests? It says he listened and he asked questions. And this isn't Jesus trying to stump the teachers. This is Jesus learning from the teachers. You see, Jesus wasn't a know-it-all. And that is how he grew to know it all. That is how he grew in wisdom. This is one of the great themes in Proverbs. A fool only enjoys expressing his opinion. But the wise man listens and asks questions. Have you ever held back from asking a question when you were in a meeting in a group because you didn't want to seem to be dumb? You were too afraid to ask a question for fear that it would be misunderstood or that you were just trying to show off. You might feel like you should know things, but you don't. How else are you going to learn unless you ask a question? Do you know what the word disciple means? It means learner. The way a disciple learns is by listening and asking questions. Asking questions is not a sign of ignorance. It is a sign of wisdom. And it is actually how you grow in wisdom. Because if you have new material that you're learning from the answers, you're going to be a little smarter than you were before. We need to be a part of humble communities where we are humble enough to listen and ask questions, but also humble enough to hear questions that we already know. Sometimes the same questions get asked over and over, and you get a little feeling of impatience. I already know that. Let's go on from here. Learn a little patience. It'll make you a little wiser. And don't look down on people for asking those questions. A humble community is a learning community. In verse 47, we learn that it wasn't just questions. Jesus actually gave answers. There's a false humility that believes we should just all get together as pupils and ask questions But there are no teachers and there are no answers. Just discussion. Good discussion is all that matters. Kind of like when you were in a a small group meeting and like our restructure committee. We're all, we've all got ideas. We share ideas and sometimes we don't have the answers. How do we get to the answers? We listen to one another, 
We try and find answers to the questions. Good discussion is all that matters. But what we see in the discussion with Jesus in the temple is different. We need to be a part of learning communities where there are more than questions. There are actual answers that are learned and so that wisdom doesn't grow by itself. It grows in community, challenging communities, humble communities, and learning communities. When Joseph and Mary finally find Jesus in the temple, they ask him, Why have you treated us like this? Think about it. As a parent, how would you feel if your child was missing for three days? Be a little upset. Worried? We think the times are bad now. We have no conception of how bad the times were back then. Again, when they asked this, why are you treating us like this? Your father and I have been so sick with worry about you. And his answer, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I might, must be in my father's house? The emphasis is on who his father is. Where does Jesus' loyalty lie? And what is he saying here in the, that was in the same way staying behind was a matter of obedience to his heavenly father? Yet when Mary and Joseph and Jesus left Jerusalem, it is a display of submissiveness to his earthly father. Luke shows us the difference between his obedience to the heavenly father and his earthly father. The path to true wisdom is not doing what you want, it's doing what God wants you to do, even if no one else understands. Submissive obedience is the path to wisdom. What we learn here is that we grow in wisdom by going through trials and tests. Growing in wisdom is like any successful team A team that learns to work together, to play together, goes through hours and hours and days of painful drills. And now who goes through the pain of trial is Mary and Joseph. Can you imagine not knowing where that child is? And you don't have means of transportation other than your own two feet to make that trip back to Jerusalem. Luke emphasizes Jesus' understanding in verse 47 with his parents' misunderstanding. Jesus wasn't the only one going, growing in wisdom in this story. Joseph and Mary are growing in wisdom too. Jesus is not just learning here, he is teaching here, and he realizes that Mary and Joseph can only grow in wisdom by going through this trial. You can understand their question in verse 48, why did you treat us so? Isn't that the question that we ask? Or sometimes, why me? Why do I have to go through this? Why are you treating me like this God. We forget that sometimes the only way Jesus can teach us is by taking us through a trial. Wisdom grows in trials and tests. The problem of losing Jesus is actually meant to be a learning opportunity for Mary and Joseph. They were learning who Jesus really is. Ultimately, he isn't their little 12-year-old boy anymore. He is their Lord and Savior who has come to do the will of the Father. How often have you said to yourself, if I can just get through this, 
Everything will be fine. But that's not the way God works. What happens when you get through the problems and move on? The problems of the present prepare us for the next situation. The problems of life are the way we get wisdom. I remember very well back in 1997 when Richard was critically ill at KSB. And one morning I drove home and I sat in my driveway and I prayed. I prayed for his healing. I was not ready to lose him. When I did that, there was a peace that came to me. I felt it. That peace that whatever God's will was is the way it would be, and nothing that I could do or say was going to change it. I, and Richard, too, has have shared his story multiple times, especially in our class at the Dixon Church. And he was not bothered. He was accepting. But one day he said to me, I'm going to die here if I don't get out of here pretty soon. And I said, you are not going to die here. We are going home together. And we did. It was a long, long time. But sometimes we are so lacking in our faith and we've tried to control a situation that is so out of our control that we have to be brought to the very point where you say, God, it is in your hands. Not my will, but yours be done. A Puritan once said that our trials are God's classroom where the greatest of lessons are learned. I believe that. When I was in nurses' training, I thought I understood my patients. But you know, after you are the patient, you have a new understanding. And uh, one of the concepts that I developed was every nurse, every physician should at some time be the patient. Then you will understand a little bit of what they are experiencing. Trials aren't meant to be desirable. They are meant to be profitable. They are meant for us to learn. God's desire is not to keep us from problems. His desire is to mature us and grow us and get us through the problems by learning. Suffering and trials are things that we are meant to walk through in order to grow in wisdom. Some of them are painful. Some of them are good. Stop and think about it. It is the people who have gone through a lot and who come out on the other side who have a lot to teach us. Why? Because wisdom grows by going through those trials. It's the immature person, the foolish person, who wants progress without a price. They are waiting for the easy break. They want to make progress without handling the problems along the way to get to their goal. Mary and Joseph came with Jesus to the feast of the Passover, the celebration of God's delivering his people from their enemies through the blood of the Lamb. But they left without Jesus and are worried sick. What if something happened to him? When they found him alive and well and learned who he really is, Jesus was preparing them for the day when he would be the true Passover lamb to die on the cross for our sins. Mary and all his disciples would leave that feast without Jesus and think he was lost forever. But three days later, 
they found him alive and well. And when they did, they would learn more and more about him. When it doesn't seem like he is in control, he really is in control. That when it seems like he is treating them badly, he was actually teaching them. And he was saving us completely. What have we learned from Jesus is that the fruit of wisdom grows on the branches of community, obedience, and trials. Amen. Let us sing our closing hymn, Joy to the World. came to worship, we go now to serve. We have been given the light, we go now to let it shine. We have been blessed by God's love, we go now to share it. We are Christ's disciples. We go now to witness to all. Amen.